This video is the second video in the evolution section. Today we're going to talk about the development of the theory of evolution, um, some of the scientists and researchers who came up with this theory of evolution and who contributed towards it. And we're going to start a little bit on natural selection. So the development of the theory of evolution. There's three major observations that can, may be made when studying the natural environment. The first is the rich biodiversity of living organisms. So the wide amount of diversity and variation within all living organisms from unicellular prokaryotes to animals, plants, fungi, and so on. The second is how these living organisms are so well adapted to their particular environment. And the third is that we can see that there are continuous changes taking place in the environment. So the observation that there are continuous changes in the environment was made by intellectuals and scientists centuries ago. The four most important scientists with reference to the theory of evolution is Erasmus Darwin, Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, Alfred Wallace, and Charles Darwin. So Erasmus Darwin um, was a respected medical doctor, poet, philosopher, botanist, and naturalist in England. He lived in about the 18th century. Um, he was actually um, Charles Darwin's grandfather, Charles Darwin being the most important uh, scientist with regard to evolution. You don't need to stress about dates or anything, but it is important to know um, what the scientists contributed to evolution. They'll often ask it um, as a multiple choice question or a short mark uh, question. So Erasmus Darwin formulated one of the first theories about evolution in his book called Zoonomia. He, his views on evolution greatly influenced the ideas of his grandson, Charles Darwin. Um, the ideas that Erasmus Darwin proposed was firstly that life on Earth originated from a single common ancestor, so a very simple life form, which we know these days to be an important part of evolution. Um, he also said that there are similarities between different organisms, which indicate that one species developed from another over time. Um, and we can relate that to um, um, what I spoke about homo homologous structures and analogous structures and modification by descent in the previous video. He also um, tried to use um, uh, tadpoles um, in his experiment to explain phenomena such as artificial selection in animals and metamorphosis. Um, and that showed how changes possibly occurred over time. Um, so this is an example of um, the metamorphosis that Erasmus Darwin showed. Then we look at Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck. So he was a French naturalist or biologist. He proposed his theory of evolution in 1809. Um, his theory of evolution was based on two very important related ideas. The first was the use or disuse of organs. He said that the use or the disuse of organs can cause the organs to increase or decrease in size or even completely disappear, depending on how much they were used. So the more the organs were used, they may increase in size, the less they were used, they may decrease in size and possibly even disappear altogether. His second theory was that during their lifetime, organisms acquire certain changes in characteristics that are then inherited by their offspring. This results in changes in the populations and the formation of new species. So we know that this isn't completely correct because over their lifetime, organisms wouldn't um, acquire characteristics, but what was correct about his um, idea was that these changes are inherited by their offspring. Um, so Lamarckism is a term that describes his ideas that an organism's acquired characteristics are transferred to his offspring, so that relates to inheritance. Um, so his first part about the use and disuse of body parts, he said as the environment changes, the organism is then forced to change, so active phenotypic changes. Um, he said if the organism isn't used, it'll become smaller. If it is used, it'll become bigger. Um, so Lamarck's ideas in general were correct and they were coming from, um, the, or the, we will see that in the future they, they are in general accurate, but his reasoning wasn't really correct because he didn't know much about genes or anything. So he just said these characteristics are acquired and he almost says that these, um, they're acquired over time because of a need for them. So for example, if a giraffe needs to reach the top of the tree, it uses an, its neck over and over and over and eventually its neck increases in size, becomes long and allows the giraffe to reach the top of the trees. And we know that over time, in one giraffe lifetime, it's not going to grow this long neck 
Um, but so that's what is incorrect. But he's right in saying that the um, the adaptation that allowed giraffes to have long necks meant that those giraffes with long necks were more likely to survive and to pass on their characteristics. So the the ones that did use their long necks meant that they were passed on and acquired to the next generation. Um, so he didn't really know about genes or anything, so his reasoning was a little bit wrong. So it's often his um, Lamarck's ideas aren't always fully recognized, but they are very, very important. Um, so this is the giraffe thing that I was talking about where there's a short-necked ancestor. It keeps stretching to reach the leaves high and high in the tree, and eventually it le it neck, its neck becomes longer, driven by this inner need to reach the um, leaves at the top of the tree. And we know that, of course, this isn't true. The giraffe neck isn't going to grow because it needs to reach the leaves at the top of the tree. What happens is there's a whole lot of giraffes, some of them with long necks, some of them with short necks. Those with long necks are more likely to reach the leaves at the top of the tree, meaning they're more likely to survive because they've got food, meaning they're more likely to have offspring and um, pass on this gene of long necks to their offspring. And that's how eventually all offspring acquire long necks. The third scientist is Alfred Wallace. He's British. He formulated a hypothesis about the mechanism of evolution and he introduced the idea of natural selection. Um, so with uh, Darwin, they jointly published an article on natural selection, but Darwin was the one who refined the theory and so we mostly give him the credit. He was mainly responsible for the acceptance of the theory of natural selection. So Charles Darwin obviously is the most important uh, naturalist and scientist in our um, content. He um, was on the survey ship, the HMS Beagle. He went on a five-year expedition to the Southern Hemisphere during the 1800s. And his task was to study the geography, plants and animals of the countries they visited. His most important observations were made on the Galapagos Islands off the Northwest coast of South America. Um, his, one of his, um, or one of the, organisms that he most importantly observed was the Galapagos finches, which we'll look at in a lot more detail over some of the next few videos. Um, so some of the observations that Charles Darwin made, these are quite important to know. He said that the individuals of a population produce more offspring than required to ensure survival of the population. So um, there's more offspring than actually required because some may die, so not all of the offspring will live to sexual maturity. He also said that there was a great deal of variation within a population, um, we, which we know is driven by genetic variation, mutations, etc., crossing over, that sort of thing. Um, this is really important. There has to be variation for natural selection to occur. Darwin also said that some individuals are better adapted to specific environments, and therefore they're more likely to reproduce, while those who are less adapted or weaker adapted may not reproduce and may even become extinct. And then he said that characteristics are transferred from the surviving parent to their offspring. Um, so this phenomenon here, where the less fit, the less adapted are die out, and the better adapted ones survive, is what we call natural selection, um, also known colloquially as survival of the fittest. Um, so this Darwin's theory of natural selection went like this. He said variations occur within a population, only some of these variations are favorable. Um, obviously, these variations are caused by mutation um, and also crossing over um, independent assortment, that sort of thing. The most important one by far being mutations. He said the more offspring are produced than can possibly survive. These organisms compete for resources. Competition is really important. And those with the favorable variations are more likely to survive. Um, so natural selection causes species to change over time and species alive today are descended with modification from ancestors. So those with fav favorable mutations are more likely to, to survive, to live to sexual maturity. They'll then um, pass on their variations. Most of the time they'll pass on this favorable um, adaptation, which means that a larger proportion of the offspring then have this um, favorable variation and over time eventually all the offspring have this favorable trait. Um, so if we just look at Lamarck versus Darwin, Lamarck said there was an original short-necked ancestor which kept stretching and stretching and stretching and eventually its neck grew. Um, this can happen over one lifetime or after a few lifetimes where we eventually land up with a long-necked um, 
ancestor. What Darwin and Wallace said is that there's one group of giraffes with um, variation in neck length. Some have short necks, some have long necks. Natural selection favors those with long necks, which means that they are more likely to survive and reproduce. That means that this favored characteristic is then passed on to the next generation. And the next generation has a greater proportion of long neck giraffes than short necks, neck giraffes. After many, many generations, millions, or not millions, but a long, long time, the group is still showing variation, but overall there's a general increase in the length of the giraffe's neck. Um, some of the fundamental aspects of evolution. So as we know in the previous video, macroevolution is evolution on a scale at or above the level of species. So these are major evolutionary changes, things that like um, speciation that actually result in new species occurring. And they take long, long periods of times. Microevolution is smaller evolutionary changes, um, usually changes in allele frequencies within a species or within a population. So macroevolution we can see is actually completely different species, um, genuses, orders, etc. Whereas microevolution is just changes within one species. Um, the, this is an example of macroevolution where we um, originated from this very simple, um, almost single-celled organisms. Um, we it became uh, an aquatic organism, eventually like a, a mostly terrestrial organism, and um, one of the species that has evolved from this today would be man. Obviously, there's many others. Microevolution is on a lot smaller scale. Um, these would all be breeds um, of dog or of wolf or fox. You can see they're all very similarly related. Um, so it would be on a much smaller scale than macroevolution. Um, and as we said, macroevolution is um, occurs over time periods that far exceed the human lifespan. You can't see macroevolution um, occurring over one lifetime. So there's a few patterns of macroevolution. The first one is equilibrium or stasis, which is just there's no period, there's no changes. Um, it happens over a very long period of time, and the organism basically stays the same. There's very little changes in them. The main example of this is the coelacanth. Um, we thought they went extinct with the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, but they were actually rediscovered off South Africa's coast in just um, less than 100 years ago. So we call them the living fossils because we've got fossils of them from 65 million years ago. But we know they were still alive, at least in 1938. Um, so that's an example of equilibrium because they haven't changed for millions and millions of years. And this would be on a um, phylogenetic tree where they, um, they, there's a split here into two different species and then these species remain virtually unchanged for millions or thousands of um, years on, on end. The second pattern is speciation or splitting, which is just the formation of a new species. Um, we call this cladogenesis, which is when one parent ancestor splits into two distinct species. Each of these species fill in new ecological niches, so they use new resources, play different and new roles in the environment. So we can see here, um, this would be one species, which is then splitting into two species over time. Um, these two species then split, um, where the most common recent, most recent common ancestor would be here. The most recent common ancestor of all three of them would be here. And this process here would be speciation. Um, a clade is a life form group consisting of a common ancestor and all its descendants. So it represents a single branch of the tree. Um, a clade and cladogenesis can be seen on a phylogenetic tree and on a cladogram. Even though it's got clad, it, it can also be phylogenetic trees. So um, if we look at examples of clades, um, this is a clade because it's one branch, um, one common ancestor and all its descendants. Here's one common ancestor, all its descendants. This is not a clade because here's a common ancestor. There's some of its descendants, but this is not included in that pink shaded part. So this pink part can't be a clade because it doesn't have all its descendants. The same here. This part is not included. So this can't be a clade because this branch is a descendant of this common ancestor, but it's not included in the shaded part. So the shaded part can't be a clade. If this part was shaded in yellow as well, we'd call that a clade because all the descendants are included with the common ancestor.
The third pattern of macroevolution is adaptive radiation. This one's quite important. It's basically just when there's a burst of divergence. So there's a sudden um, uh, divergence, a sudden um, amount of new species suddenly are formed. Um, obviously, sudden, not sudden as in like over a year, but not over millions of years. It happens relatively quickly on an evolutionary timescale, still very, very slowly if we look at like our lifetime scale. Um, it's because there's a whole lot of new ecological niches that mainly need to be filled, um, new uh, roles to be played, new food sources, um, new types of competition, and so on. Example of this was the Galapagos finches. Um, we can see here that there's, there's one founder species and suddenly there's a burst of divergence to form all these new uh, species. That's adaptive radiation. And the last pattern is extinction. Um, obviously extinction we know is when species suddenly die out. Extinction can happen frequently, it can happen rarely. We've obviously had mass extinctions. It says here that mass extinctions is when more than 99% of species living on earth are extinct, but it doesn't have to be that uh, big. It's usually around about 70 to 80% of species become extinct. Species as in plants, animals, bacteria, fungi, everything. Um, and obviously when this happens, we suddenly have these new open niches. So often after extinction, we might have some adaptive radiation because there's suddenly this whole lot of new um, food sources, new resources, new roles to be played in the environment. And we can see here that these like dinosaurs would be an example of extinction where they die out. Uh, some of the mass extinctions are these ones and you can see they usually have um, pretty high death rates where um, sometimes even 95% of species will die out. Uh, in, in younger years you might have had to learn these mass extinctions but I haven't seen them from a trick. I've never seen them asked in the past paper. So I wouldn't stress about learning the names or the details of these ones. And obviously as you should know by now we're going through the sixth mass extinction right now, mostly caused by humans, um, where as humans grow, the number of extinctions um, rise hugely. So we say that this obviously must be related. There must be some sort of link between these two. It doesn't take a lot to figure out what's causing all these extinctions. Um, but obviously these sort of mass extinctions aren't really that important. The more important thing to know is what the patterns are of, micro of macroevolution. Can you explain them? That sort of thing.